All right. Hello, everyone. It is now one o'clock, at least here in Minnesota. Um, and we are excited to have you joining us for the last of our webinars in the series for 2020. Um, today, we're going to be welcoming Nick Phelps. Uh, Nick is the director of the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center and an assistant professor in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Biology. And he's going to be sharing a, a new tool for online support. Um, his talk is called uh, Online Decision Support Tool to Prioritize AIS Surveillance and Watercraft Inspection Activities. I am Megan Weber, an extension educator here at the University of Minnesota, focusing on aquatic invasive species and I'll be your moderator today. I'm going to go over a couple of housekeeping items and then I'm going to turn it over to Nick to share his talk. Um, we have we started so we've got the first one down on that list. Um, everyone will be muted and it will remain that way for the remainder of the webinar. Um, if you look towards the bottom of the screen, you should see a spot to chat. Um, you can use that to send your questions. Send them on over at any point during the webinar. We're going to be keeping track of them and we'll pull them up um, at the end and start working our way through that question list. Um, so feel free to type them in whenever the, that comes into your head. Um, Pat um, is on the line as well, and he'll be here to help with any technical issues as well. Uh, Pat is available in chat, so you can send a message to panelists and he'll be there to help work you through that. You can direct message him, I think, um, or you can also send him an email um, and he'll be monitoring that email throughout the webinar as well. Um, and finally, we are recording today's webinar. So if um, you miss something or have to get up and walk away for any reason, don't worry, we'll have that recording up. It usually takes about a week for us to get that turned around and up onto our YouTube channel, um, but we'll be sure to send you a notice when that is ready. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to Nick now to share his new tool. Thanks, Nick. All right, thank you, Megan. Um, All right, so you should be seeing my title slide now and hearing me all right. Looks great. Awesome, thank you. All right, thanks for joining everybody and um, thanks to the Detectors program for the invitation to speak this afternoon. Um, this is a project that we've been working on for the last five years or so. Um, it's really at an exciting stage where the research is coming to fruition and we're starting to apply it to real world problems. and. Um, I'm, I'm really excited here today to uh, talk to you about the, the research and then the tool that we've developed to help prioritize EIS prevention activities here in Minnesota. So this is the question that started it all um, for this project. I found myself a while back in a fairly contentious meeting um, between stakeholders and managers um, trying to decide how to allocate very limited resources on the landscape to prevent the spread. How can we be the most efficient with our resources? And the research is clear that not all lakes are equally likely to be infested. I mean, that much we knew going into that conversation. But we, what we didn't know, and what I couldn't help with at the time, was which lakes might have been at the greatest risk. And if we were going to prioritize in a strategic way um, where would we put that intervention? How would we allocate that funding to be the most efficient um, with this goal of preventing the spread of AIS? For those of you that are familiar with Minnesota, uh, many of you uh, are from here, you know that it's an awfully complicated question um, when you think about introduction risk and how things move around the landscape. In Minnesota, we have uh, thousands and thousands of rivers and streams connecting 10,000 different lakes. Um, we have 800,000 registered boats moving around the landscape, hundreds of infested waters and thousands more that need protection. Um, so it's a pretty daunting task um, uh, and something that we set out to um, really get our hands around. The first step though in, in all of this, I, I mean, I left this meeting with this question and how can we help? Um, the first step was to assemble a team. And um, I started working with folks across disciplines, um, really learning quickly that there was no single expertise that could answer the problem that we had. So we brought um, experts from veterinary uh, epidemiology, um, public health experts, 
uh, computer scientists, ecologists, uh, mathematicians, um, computer uh, developers, website um, platform developers, uh, managers, the, the whole spectrum of uh, different disciplines were brought to bear on this problem. And the credit uh, for a lot of what you see over the next um, half hour or so uh, goes to the folks here and um, all of us that were putting it all together and the many more who aren't uh, on this website right now. Our objective um, early on was to develop an eco-epidemiological model that would inform risk-based management activities to prevent the spread of AIS. Really bringing together the ecosystem, the environmental factors of how things spread, as well as the human factors. I mean, of course, many of the invasive species that we care about here in Minnesota move through human-mediated pathways. And it's critical that we understand how people move these things and how the what their role is um, in addressing this problem. They're, Part of the problem and part of the solution as you're, you'll come to learn here. So I'm going to walk you through how we address this question. Um, briefly, the outline for the talk, I'm going to discuss how we collected and organized data. Uh, fortunately, here in Minnesota, we were, um, we had many big data sets to work with. And this makes us unique from a lot of other states and created an opportunity to um, develop a new approach um, going forward. I'm going to talk about the models that we created, um, two in particular, and then I'll end with how we started to visualize these recommendations and put it online and show you the online tool um, and how to access it. The first data source is fairly obvious. So if we want to think about how um, invasive species uh, spread across the landscape, we need to know where they are right now. And the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources maintains an infested waters list. From this list, we um, looked at all lakes that were confirmed to be infested. So these are bodies of water where a zebra mussel has been um, confirmed, not just thought to be there or connected to an infested lake, but um, for sure present. Uh, the DNR updates this list sporadically as reports get confirmed from the field. Um, what we do on our end is we look at this website weekly and download the data set and update our models um, over the weekends. So it keeps our models running in relative real time and are updated um, to account for new infestations because of course, when a new lake becomes invaded, that becomes a source for future infestation and changes risk across the landscape. The first pathway that we considered um, was water connectivity. Research has shown that being connected through water to an infested lake makes you at greater risk. Um, so we set out to try to map the water connections here in Minnesota. And this um, was a much more difficult process than we, said, than we initially thought, but we have a, a pretty solid network now to work with. The information that was initially feeding it were GIS layers for water bodies in the state, and then a separate layer for the river and stream connections that go between them. These layers don't perfectly align, so we had to do a fair bit of satellite um, verification using satellite images um, and create rules on how to sort of link those GIS layers. Ultimately, what we got were these networks of water body connections in the state um, the edges or these connections are um, both directional, so we know which way the water flows, and it's also weighted by the distance of the water connection. So um, those are both very important factors when considering risk of downstream spread of an invasive species. The second uh, big data set that we had, um, and we spent the majority of the last five years trying to figure out how to use, um, was the watercraft inspection data. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has a very robust watercraft inspection program. They've been uh, surveying and inspecting watercraft at boat ramps for the last couple of decades. Um, it serves a variety of purposes, including just physical inspection to remove invasive species, but also an educational opportunity um, to intercept uh, boaters as they're moving about. 
Um, but one of the uh, important aspects of the survey and became really critical to this work. Um, and this, these surveys were not designed for the purpose of this project, but we were able to benefit from it. Um, the survey asked the boaters, where were they before? And they asked the boater, where are they going next? And of course, we know where the boater is at the time of the inspection. So the huge data set here, and over these four years, we had about 1.3 million uh, usable inspection surveys. This made about a million connections before and after. When you start to aggregate all this information, uh, it allows us to create a network of connectivity between water bodies in the state. This is something that has been uh, done in the past. There's papers published on this approach, um, but nothing with a data set this large. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to organize and manipulate um, this information. Before I talk about that, though, I just want to be clear that there were a lot of challenges with the data set as well. Um, the lake and county pairs in the survey are independent choices. So they asked the boater, um, what lake were you at? And then separately, what county were you in? Um, that created some matching uh, issues. Um, and if we weren't entirely confident that the lake was appropriately identified or couldn't be adjusted for, um, that data was excluded. Um, so in total, about 20% of the data was taken out of the raw data set because there was plenty of um, boaters out there who didn't know where they were going to go next or refused to answer where they were before. Um, so just for those reasons, about 20% about was um, removed. I do want to acknowledge a concern for accuracy. Um, of course, this relies on recall bias and the boaters planned future activity. And both of those things might be incorrectly stated in the survey. And it's also possible that boaters just intentionally make up information to mislead who they think is a manager at a, a boat ramp. Um, and while these things can play a role in uh, data sets like this, I'm fairly confident when you get numbers this large that the trends are really captured and for the small percent of boaters that might be intentionally misleading somebody, um, it really doesn't become an issue when the data gets to be this big. Then about 1% of the boaters in the survey reported being connected either before or coming up to an out-of-state location. Now those are really important movements, of course, because zebra mussels came to Minnesota from somewhere at one point, and if it's via boats, um, that was an out-of-state boat movement. It's really important that we capture this um, unfortunately, the, the survey just documents that the boat came from Wisconsin. Um, it doesn't know which lake in Wisconsin. For that reason, we had to remove the data because we could not attribute the initial source and the, assign any sort of risk score to it. So this is what the data looks like conceptually. Um, within the 1.6 million reported movements. Um, like that's our data set of known information. Um, it included 737 lakes that were inspected. So these are lakes where an inspector sat there and interviewed boaters. There were an additional 1,400 lakes that were connected to those um, inspected lakes as the previous or next lake. Um, so we had about 2,500 or so lakes that were in the network. Um, and a whole bunch of others that were not. Um, this left us with a lot of question marks. If a lake did not receive inspection effort, um, we really didn't have any idea how boats were moving around. Um, so this is where, <laughs> um, over the next couple slides here, I'll summarize about two years worth of work. Um, filling in these gaps took a lot of effort, but I think was really important in trying to um, uh, provide a robust network and really get a sense of how people are moving around the landscape. So filling in the gaps, um, we had a three-step process and I'll walk you through these just very briefly. And if you've got questions in more detail, I'm happy to come back to it in the Q&A or follow up afterwards with um, via email. Um, it gets to be pretty complicated, but uh, hopefully you'll get the concept anyways. For um, using all of the known data, 
we were able to infer connections for lakes where we had no data. So for those lakes where we did not have information or for all lakes really, um, we predicted the incoming boater traffic for every lake. So this estimated the essentially the popularity of how many boats are coming into that water body. The second step was to predict the connections. So give any given lake, what lakes could it be connected to? And both steps one and two were informed by attributes of the different water bodies and surrounding areas. So big lakes were often connected to other big lakes. Um, for example, if you're closer to population centers, um, you're more likely to have higher boater traffic. Uh, things like that start to get put into these computational models and um, start to fill in these gaps. And then step three, we combined really steps one and two. So we had the popularity for a lake and what it was connected to, and then we proportionally moved those boats across those connections. So let's say we have Long Lake and we estimate that a uh, hundred boats go there in a year and it's connected to five other water bodies. Step three then predicts how those 100 boats are going to be spread across those five connections. Maybe 80% go to Lake A, 10% um, go to Lake B, and the other 10% get equally distributed between the other three lakes. So this starts to really fill in gaps um, and estimates a new network. We used, um, for the methods folks in the crowd, we used XGBoost, it's a machine learning algorithm to run these models. Um, we validated everything with uh, training data sets. We hid some of the known data just to see how well we would predict it. And uh, quite impressively, um, and really credit goes to the inspection program and just the vast amount of data that we had to build these models. 97% um, of the time, we were accurately predicting a known connection. So that is pretty incredible with models like this and networks. Um, and so we're really happy with how it performed and gave us a lot of confidence in what we call the estimated boater network. So this is what we have now. We have a map of Minnesota with boats moving uh, all over the place between lakes, um, basically assuming that every lake was inspected based on these models. When you look at it on the landscape, for those of you not from here, we got a lot of lakes and a lot of boats. Um, they go all over the place. So you get a sense here that the state gets covered up with boat traffic pretty quickly. These lines, um, you can't see it in this figure here, but they're directional. So we know which way boats are moving. Um, and they're also weighted by the number of boats that move between those connections. So while it looks like any individual lake is connected to a lot of other lakes, many of those connections are pretty weak. And it's really those high traffic routes that um, become important when we get into simulating future spread. Lots of ways to look at network statistics. Um, I won't belabor this point, but uh, if you were uh, suspecting that more connected and more popular water bodies were more likely to be infested, you would be right. Um, that was supported here and there's, um, we dove into it quite a bit and um, working on a paper that describes all this right now. So the one last piece of data that I wanna um, talk about is uh, the at-risk boats. And this will become infor important for the um, watercraft inspection optimization. We took that big network and we really, we subsetted it for boats that we determined to be at risk. Those moving from an infested water body to an uninfested water body. If you're gonna be strategic in your intervention, this is the movement you wanna intercept somehow. Boats moving between uninfested and uninfested lakes really aren't a problem. And if you're moving from an uninfested to an infested lake, again, not really a problem. It's not contributing risk um, of spread. So we really wanna capture that first arrow there um, and the subset of the network um, does that. So that, that I hope gives you a sense of some of the data um, that, we that we have been using to inform these models. Um, understanding where the data comes from, I think is important when you look at the outputs of the models and the, um, the strength and the limitations of them. Um, but as we were putting all this together, we worked closely with managers, at, um, a variety of scales and uh, other stakeholders to really 
really understand what management questions they had. Um, what could these models do? If we were gonna create a model for you, what would you want solved? Um, and going back to that very initial meeting that I had where this all began, um, these were the two things that continually came up. They wanted uh, estimates for introduction risk, which is really important for informed surveillance activities. And they wanted uh, lakes prioritized for watercraft inspections based on risky boat movement. Um, I'm going to, on the next few slides, walk through how these models were created. Um, again, I'm going to skip some of the um, brutal details here and just sort of conceptually walk you through how this works. Um, and if I can answer the questions at the end, I'm happy to do so. So please save any questions um, for the Q&A time. So I'll begin with the introduction risk for surveillance model. Um, this is the first thing that they wanted us to look at. So lots of ways to do this. Um, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. For us, we use the Bayesian modeling approach where a Bayesian model allows the model to essentially be informed by prior data and then learn from itself over time um, to create uh, future predictions. Um, so for the, both zebra mussels and starry stonewort, we created these models. Um, we subset the invasion history um, in half, essentially. So for zebra mussels, uh, in 2012, half of the lakes have been invaded. And from 2012 to 2018, the other half of the lakes became invaded. Just to give you a sense of how we use a training data set and then a validation data set. Starry Stonewart had a much shorter runway for us to work with. Um, but you'll, and you'll see how this plays out um, in the next slide, um, but we did give it a shot for Starry. I should point out too that this slide is a bit dated now and these models have continued to update um, to present day. These dates are a little bit old um, at this point, but you'll get the idea of what we did. So again, we had this, um, we built the models up until 2012 for zebra mussels and we ran them for six years to see how well it performed. We estimated the number of lakes that became invaded and we looked at what actually happened. Once we recalibrated, we got, um, we were happy with the model, we recalibrate things and we can predict into the future. And we run this 10,000 times. Um, each time it gives a different set of lakes that become invaded. Um, so after 10,000 iterations, you get a probability that any given lake in the state got zebra mussels eight years into the future. Importantly, this model runs at annual time steps. So a lake that becomes invaded two years into the model can be a source of future invasion in year three, four, five, and so on. And so again, this model can learn from itself um, and predict what's happening. Here's what the output looks like. Um, on the left-hand side, you have zebra mussels. The black bars are what we thought would happen with the model. So um, over that five-year period there, this is what we thought would happen. The red circles are what actually happened. And you can see really strong agreement between the predictions and actual events. Then recalibration and you forecast into the future eight years. And this here is the status quo model. If we continue on with management as it exists today, this is how many lakes we would expect um, to have zebra mussels introduced to um, and have uh, viable infestations. Starry stonewort, on the other hand, um, you show this kind of figure to any modeling person and they're gonna get chills because uh, one data point does not build a model, at least with any confidence. So you run this into the future and um, you get huge uncertainty. This has continued to improve. We're in 2020 now, of course, and the model has um, more information to work with and is getting stronger. Um, but you can see the difference here between these two examples. It also shows uh, this whole process that I've described with these Bayesian models is very similar to how COVID-19 is being forecasted, for example. Early in the pandemic, we had a starry stonewort situation where we had a few um, occurrences. We were trying to learn from a very short runway and there's a lot of uncertainty. Now we're more of in a zebra mussel situation where we've got some lessons learned. We have a better sense of how things spread and we have more accuracy in the predictions. So, um, 
the same approaches are being uh, used in a variety of uh, situations here. Shifting gears a little bit to prioritizing for watercraft inspection effort. Um, here we used an optimization modeling approach. Um, we formulated the question to be, um, and you can have all sorts of different uh, problem formulations for optimization models. This is what we picked based on the conversations we were having with county managers. They wanted us to select lakes for inspection stations to maximize the number of risky boats that are inspected. Okay, so we're trying to intercept the highest number of risky boats. We did not limit the model on where it could put inspectors. It could be at an infested lake or an uninfested lake. We used integer programming to do this in the GAM CPLEX software. Um, and we've later uh, switched everything over to R so it runs much faster and I'm a little more user-friendly to work with in the online dashboard. So we're gonna uh, take a quick break here just to see how well you do with a problem like this. This is a very simplified version here. Imagine if we had two infested lakes and two uninfested lakes. And those arrows are the connections between them and how many boats are moving across that pathway. So you can see infested lake um, A has 20 boats going to C and 20 boats going to D. This is how boats move around the landscape. This is exactly the problem that we're trying to solve just at a larger scale. So Pat, if you wouldn't mind throwing up the poll here, um, please uh, take a guess, where would you put the inspector in this scenario to maximize the number of risky boats that are inspected? And we'll give you 20 seconds or so to do the math quick and give us a response. All right, so 81% of you, awesome, uh, picked the correct answer, and that is C. Um, so this is, a, like again, a very simplified version, um, and can be, when you start to get increasing complexity, a bit um, difficult to follow sometimes. It's the gut reaction, and it's totally understandable to want to put the inspector on either A or B. Um, you want to contain the infestation. But when you consider how boats move and how risky those, how to maximize intercepting those risky boats, your most efficient option is to put your inspector at Lake C. Um, there are 50 risky boats moving there um, compared to 40 and 30 in the other lakes. So for those of you that picked C, um, congratulations. Now, when you scale this up to hundreds or thousands of lakes with millions of boat movements. Um, it gets to be impossible to do on paper and is why we have to create complicated models. This is what one of the outputs looks like um, at the county level. We worked with one of the county managers and here is just the prioritization of lakes, the top 10. And at the bottom, you get the proportion of risky boats that are inspected. Um, relatively straightforward process but not always intuitive when you get into that middle tier of lakes because you're really trying to get those, um, uh, capture those risky boats. And when you take out the first few lakes, uh, it starts to change the network dynamics for everything else. So it's, uh, um, it's an important process to work through um, in a way like this versus just looking at just raw popularity or um, something like that. So we've created, we had a bunch of data, we created models. Um, we thought we were doing pretty well a couple of years ago. We put this on our website as static Excel sheets, um, working with counties one at a time, um, useful, but we heard loud and clear that this wasn't really addressing the problem um, and definitely not at a state scale. Um, so we've spent the last year and a half moving these models online. Um, really sort of uh, building a tool that checked a lot of the boxes that managers were asking for. And I think that um, although at a, uh, 
was built for managers. I think stakeholders from across the board um, can find value here and play around with it um, and ask a variety of different questions. The tool that we built um, is called the AIS Explorer. And the website is here. Um, I'll have it again at the end of the presentation. If you all jump on the website now, it's probably gonna crash. Um, it's a very computationally intensive platform, um, but I encourage you to check it out uh, at your leisure um, and play around. I'll show you some screenshots here um, in the next few slides. So this is the, the start slide. You can um, enter the dashboard here. I do wanna point out a couple things first. Um, we consider this version 2.0 of the model. Um, I know that there are, um, just with data sets this big, there's going to be some errors. Um, at the local level, there's some lakes that might be uh, mislabeled, um, some lakes that aren't captured in the network yet. Uh, we're working to solve those problems. This is a work in progress, um, a big first step here, but uh, it will get better over time. The second thing I want to point out is that this is a decision support tool. Um, this tool should not replace a manager's um, professional expertise and on the ground um, awareness. There are things that happen or, or reasons managers make decisions that might not be mathematically optimal, but really important to consider. So these outputs um, make mathematical sense, but may not be the whole story in the real world. So. Decision support, um, not a replacement tool, just to be clear on the limitations of it. So this first tab, uh, this is the introduction risk for surveillance. And what you get when you click into here are all the lakes in the state, or many of them anyways, um, and the assigned risk. Um, you can see the scale bar on the right-hand side. Green is um, less risk, the redder is greater risk. Again, this is the probability after 10,000 iterations that this lake became infested eight years into the future. If it's dark red here, it's already infested. You can see on the left-hand side, there's options to click between zebra mussels and starry stonewort. You can scale the risk that you wanna look at for a variety of reasons. We look at individual counties or the whole state. Um, you can turn on different layers. You can export all of this as a CSV file. Um, or a shape file if you want to use the picture for a presentation, for example. Um, you just got some options to play around with. Uh, this tool here um, would be really useful for a local manager or uh, maybe a coalition of lake associations who are trying to prioritize where to do surveillance. Um, you could download at any county level um, from greatest risk to least risk for zebra mussels or starry stonewort to be introduced. And this will help prioritize how you allocate your limited um, resources. You can click on any given lake and it gives you demographics, um, network demographics about that water body. So Long Lake here in Candy Hawaii County, 52% likelihood that this is going to become infested eight years into the future. You can see the boater network information there on the, towards the bottom. Um, about 25% of the boats coming into Long Lake are coming from infested water bodies. So this is interesting. Um, it weighs into the surveillance uh, model here, um, but uh, is different than the optimization, the watercraft inspection stuff that I'll, I'll talk about next. Um, but this is just showing you those raw estimated network statistics. You can click on any given lake and it shows you that spider plot. Um, people like to poke around on their favorite lake to see what it's connected to. Um, shifting gears to the watercraft prioritization model. Um, it's just another tab on the top of the, the website you can go to. Um, and this is what this dashboard looks like. This is done at the county level right now. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can pick any given county in Minnesota. Um, you can customize the lakes that it includes. Um, so maybe you don't want to include a border lake or maybe a lake association is going to cover their lake or the DNR is going to put inspectors there so the county doesn't want to run it in their model. Um, you could manually take those in or out um, depending on what your management objective is. Um, so in this scenario, uh, we have Aiken County pulled up 
let's say they care only about zebra mussels um, and they want to ins inspect 60% of the risky boats. This model recommends locating um, inspectors at 17 different water bodies. And on the right hand side, you can see the cost benefit curve of putting inspectors at those um, at that number of locations. This is helpful for maybe a county board that's thinking about uh, return on investment. You can see that diminishing return as you move to the right on this curve. If you're more a visual person, you can look at a map and see which lakes should be picked. Um, just another way to look at it. Now let's say Aiken County cares about um, all four of these invasive species that we have on here that we believe um, have high risk of moving through the boater pathway. Um, starry stonewort, raised water milfoil, and spiny water flea. Um, to maintain a 60% uh, threshold, they need to add another two inspection stations. Um, so this, again, just a piece of information the, inspect the local manager can play around with. Let's say that 60% is um, not enough for you, that you want to have 80%. Um, you're going to move up to 52 inspection stations. Uh, this really for the first time provides local managers with some quantitative information about what their decisions look like. Um, they can tell their stakeholders that with 52 inspection stations, we can inspect 80% of the risky boats. Um, that's a, a useful piece of information when uh, socializing decisions. A couple of limitations to point out here on the um, this inspection uh, uh, recommendation at the county level. Um, what we do not have in the data right now are which acts or how many access points are um, being inspected in any given lake. So if a lake has two access points, it's showing up here as a single lake. Um, that's important local information that a manager will have to think through when interpreting these results. Um, we haven't built it in yet because at the state scale, we do not have the data to do so. Um, but it's something we'd like to add into the future. And I should point out too, on the left-hand side, again, you can export um, these files as either images of the map or the chart, um, or you can export this as a CSV file and it starts to um, break it down in a way that a manager can manipulate a spreadsheet or start to prioritize things um, over time. And then again, both, uh, both pieces of this dashboard are updated weekly. So um, when a new infestation occurs, risk is going to change and that will result in different recommendations. So I um, would encourage folks to not just um, take a peek at this in March while they're making their initial plans. But if they're thinking about adaptive management strategies to keep an eye on this over the course of the field season. Um, I just wanna wrap up with uh, some thoughts on my, uh, our future directions. Um, like I said, this is version 2.0. There will be a 3.0 and hopefully a 4.0 someday. They're gonna be more complex. Um, we have more data. Um, we just haven't figured out how to use it all yet. Um, boat demographics will be really important to consider. Of course, uh, all watercraft aren't equally risky either. So a wakeboard boat is different than a kayak, for example. So accounting for that in these risk models will be um, interesting to, to consider. The time of day for inspection effort or um, seasonal risk patterns would be cool to look at. Um, it'd be great to add additional priority species as we um, get information to do so. And then additional data sources. Um, we have one type of information through these watercraft inspection surveys, but um, there are other types of data out there and we're starting to explore how those could be combined with ours um, or uh, used to validate these models. Um, it's pretty exciting to see where more data can make these even stronger. We have a lot of interest in creating multi-state networks for other states that have similar types of data, we could start to link states. So for the first time, we can understand what the risk of out-of-state boat movements are to Minnesota, for example. We have a paper in review right now that's looking at multi-county cooperation for watercraft inspections. Um, we know that if counties work together, um, they can reduce risk overall, and that um, is intuitive, but it's not something that's happening when 
counties get money and they allocate it within their county, um, that's uh, an obvious first step. But we think if the counties can start uh, working together and if we can use these models to help inform where that might make the most sense, we'll have much more efficient management at the state level. We're going to be uh, incorporating strategic prevention activities into the model to reduce risk. So come up with any number of intervention scenarios that either affect the network, how bullets move around, or the risk that any given connection changes. So um, we could do that mathematically. And let's say you wanna apply uh, intensive outreach programs in the Southern half of the state. Um, we could see, and maybe we can make the assumption that it reduces risk by 5%. Um, we could see how that affects future invasion scenarios, um, really in the safety of a model, not in the real world where we're guessing and spending maybe millions of dollars um, and then hoping we learn something five years from now. We could do it, um, test out 20, 30, 50 models um, and see what happens. And lastly, um, we've also done what I haven't talked about um, is whether or not the species would survive once it gets there. I think that that is clearly a really important part to understanding risk. Um, how we incorporate that into the model is still an ongoing question and how managers um, interpret suitability. Um, would you allow, for example, zebra mussels to be introduced to a lake if we say that they're probably not going to survive? I mean, that's like, there's a, a management threshold there, a uh, risk tolerance. Um, and so once we can figure out how to do that, um, we'll be able to blend these two models and really create something that's um, uh, even better than what we have now. And again, there's a, a ton more um, that we could do going forward. And if you have ideas for ways to improve the models, the data, how this is visualized, any of this that I've talked about, um, or you have data sets of your own that you want to play around with, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to me or other folks in the project team. Um, and be happy to talk about collaboration and um, expanding this to, to be stronger. So with that, um, Megan and Pat, if we've got, we should have plenty of time for questions if folks have them. My email is here on this last slide. Um, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email if you want to chat more. Um, and then again, the link to the AS Explorer is um, right here. If it's running a little slow, um, just check back um, at some point and hopefully it'll bandwidth will free up a little bit. Thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you, Nick, for sharing that. That was a really great presentation and great to learn uh, more about the tool. I'm just going to switch over to the screen so everyone can see the housekeeping again. And if Nick needs to pop back onto his um, screen to answer any questions, don't worry, he'll be able to do that. Um, so again, if you have any questions, well, there's some that have come in already, so I'll start working my way through those here shortly. Um, just go ahead and type those into the chat. Um, if you have any technical issues still, Pat's still around to help with those out. And we'll, we'll just ask the questions until we run out of time. We'll stop promptly at 2 central time. So. Um, Nick, the first question that came in was um, at the beginning, especially when you were talking about your example, you had mentioned that it was for zebra mussels. So um, one of the questions was, is, is this um, a, a tool that's specific to like zebra mussels or a species or does it, will it generally um, look at risk for all potential AIS? So the um, risk model is uh, developed and validated based on the species. So we've done that so far for zebra mussels and starry stonewort. Um, if we had a little more time in the day, we could start adding additional species um, as well. For the watercraft inspection model, um, that is really uh, weighting each species the same. So it's just defining it as a risky boat. Um, so you could add any number of species you want to to that scenario. We just picked the top four that we were hearing from managers were important and we're likely to move through the boater pathway. All right, so I think, I think that might actually um, 
answer the next question as well, but just in case there's any nuance to this, I'll still I'll still ask it. But wondering about, um, are there any physical water body characteristics, for example, water chemistry that are considered as part of the model, knowing that not all water bodies might be suitable for each of the AIS? Um, water chemistry and other environmental factors are not considered um, directly in the model. Um, that would be sort of that suitability piece that I uh, mentioned at the very last bullet point. Um, we've been building suitability models for starry stonewort and zebra mussels and uh, milfoil and other things too. Um, but that, that's a separate modeling approach that ideally starts to get combined with this one. So we look at both, can it get there and will it survive if it does as like a, um, a bigger risk uh, score. Sure. Um, and do you know if there are any um, counties that are already using this software as part of their planning? Um, the AIS Explorer is hot off the press. Um, this has been public for just a few weeks now. Um, we've held workshops with uh, county managers. We've had 10 different workshops um, where county managers have signed on and we've um, introduced the dashboard and talked about the the strengths and weaknesses. Um, we've had very positive feedback and it sounds like uh, many counties will be using this at least to inform their decisions. Um, we have worked with uh, several counties including Stearns, Crow Wing, um, Ramsey, um, several others too in the developmental stages and they have been starting to incorporate like the early stages of the model um, at the local level. So. Uh, these are being used um, at least in part to how both how watercraft inspection efforts being assigned. All right. And then um, someone was wondering about other applications for this tool set. So for example, could it be used for prevention tools such as like the CD3 stations or decontamination units or something along those lines? Um, definitely. So uh, you know, that's a really good question. And that's where we hope to go with the model in the future, this um, sort of intervening into the model is a grant that we just got funded. Um, and we'll play around with some, like specifically DECON, uh, watercraft inspectors, um, CD3 stations. Uh, we're going to estimate the effectiveness, the cost of those. Um, so the first time really having uh, the cost benefit and then the resulting infestation predictions for a variety of prevention scenarios. Um, so that is definitely something we can play around with. It's just going to take a little time to, um, to do that. Great. Um, so then knowing that 100% um, prevention or 100% staffing might not be feasible, um, does the tool give like a guide to managers on what an optimal percentage of, of um, like inspection stations um, might be? And, and if so, do you know what that, what that optimal percentage is? Um, I think I follow the question. So the recommendation, so the, the output from the optimization model um, is at the lake level and aggregated for boat movement um, throughout the year. So it does not, at least as it exists online right now, um, break it down by time of day or day of week of how a local inspector might want to allocate resources. So I know a lot of inspectors like to staff boat ramps Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, you can't do that here. Um, but this might start to prioritize um, the order of lakes. And if you're going to just staff weekends, um, the proportion of risky boats at least would be the same. Great. And I'll let James, I, I think I think what James is asking, and James, if I have this wrong, um, feel free to chime into chat and I'll, 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 I'll correct it. I think what he's asking is more like um, on a countywide basis, would it say like um, the, the you can get like the most bang for your buck by staffing, um, I think 60% was like a number that I saw appear on the AS Explorer, something like that. So if you have 60% of, you know, these lakes covered, um, would that would that be an optimal number? And James, feel free to chime in if I'm if I'm interpreting your question wrong. Okay, yeah, I, I think the way you described it there, Megan is right. Um, the sixty percent is the number of boats you will inspect, not the number of lakes you're covering. So 
you set the number of boats you want to, to capture and it tells you how many lakes to inspect. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what it does. Great. Um, and then does, does the tool um, take into account or compensate for um, out of state boats and how do those factor in? Um, we do not capture out of state boats right now. So from the raw data set of those 1.6 million movements, about 1% were coming or going from out of state. Um, and they're not in here. This is a within state network right now. Um, we just don't have the data to capture the out of state movement. Um, that's something we're working on though right now. And um, hopefully a year from now I can come back and tell you that we've got that figured out. Um, but that's something I, I definitely want to do. Um, uh, so stay tuned for that question. Great. Uh, so uh, along the terms of predicting, uh, this, this question popped up when you were showing the projections that the model had spit out for uh, zebra mussels and starry stonewort. Um, and I don't think it yet showed how things matched up now that we're in 2020. Do you have um, that data on how well the model did now up to where we are now? Um, I haven't plotted it like that in the same way uh, up until now, but if you look at those trends, the way we predicted it back in um, uh, 2018, I think is when that cut off. It was just under 300 or so lakes were estimated to be infested with zebra mussels and we're approaching that um, pretty quickly. So we're not that far off from the, the forecast. Great, all right. Um, and then will, will the tool also help to inform um, which lakes may have the least amount of traffic um, so that you could maybe use other tools for protecting lakes that maybe are not having um, that same pressure on them? That's an interesting question. Um, that's not something, so we could for sure do that with uh, these networks. It's not a management strategy that we've considered um, in all of the modeling we've done though. So it would just be um, sort of reframing the problem statement for the optimization model. And you could definitely rerun it to, to have other scenarios. If people have ideas of different scenarios or questions that they would want answered um, or interventions that you'd want us to consider in the future, uh, please send those to me and we'll do what we can to incorporate it into the future work. Great, thanks. Yeah, and for anyone who's wanting to connect with Nick, don't worry, we're gonna show his email again at the screen. And maybe if Pat has um, a spare spot, I don't have chat up, maybe Pat can drop it in a chat right now so everyone can see it there. Um, so I see another question here, um, wondering about what this might mean for the way inspections is, are happening. So for example, would we likely see, um, for if, if this tool are used, would we likely see a reduction of, um, inspections at highly infested lakes and more of an increase on lakes that are not yet infested or, or what might the impacts like that be? The impacts are going to um, be highly variable probably. There might be some, uh, you know, at the, if we're thinking at the county level, um, some inspectors might be pretty accurate in where things are at right now. Um, some might be waiting um, certain types of lakes more than others. And uh, this model might disagree with their current strategy. Um, so it could be any variety of scenarios, depending on what the local manager has um, been considering so far. All right, great. Um, and let's see, I think this question came in kind of towards the end as you were wrapping up about like, the what the data was that was coming in um, and how that might be applied in other other things you're looking at for the future. So hopefully that helps with the context. Um, but the question was, um, isn't survival kind of built into the data that you use since you were um, not looking at introductions, but more what was actually occurring? Um, it, okay, so that, that's a really good question. And I, um, yeah, that's a really good question. It is for what's, so the model's been informed about what was realized from the introduction. So uh, everything that's fed into the model assumes that it got there and assumes that it survived, of course. When we predict into the future, we're assuming that everything is equally suitable. Um, and it's that future projection where suitability might become important to consider. 
um, it's very possible that zebra mussels have been introduced to many more lakes and they just didn't survive. Um, so it's, it's built on what actually happened, you're right, but going forward, um, that isn't the case with the model and we need to account for it somehow, I think. All right, and um, I see someone had made an observation that Wisconsin uses a fairly similar um, voter inspection program. Um, so it might be interesting to see some collaboration or ability to combine data sets. So I think maybe maybe the question that then comes from this is, what is um, the transferability to other states um, or ability to kind of combine those and maybe even pulling in from the other question that that out of state data aspect? Yeah, we've already been chatting with um, some of the folks over in Wisconsin, we were funded to um, build a Wisconsin version of this. Their data is similar, but um, creates, uh, it's similar, but different. And it's gonna create some data management challenges that we haven't had to deal with yet. So um, we're optimistic that we can build something like this um, for Wisconsin at least. I know that the state of New York has uh, really good boat movement data too, and the Western states um, track boat movement uh, very well, very similar type of survey. So I, I think there's definite opportunity to um, apply the state version. And if we can get the surveys to um, accurately identify out of state movements, then we start connecting these state models. And then things get super cool because <laughs> so you can start seeing how the state spread connects to other states. Um, and we can do this for the Great Lakes region or the Western states could start to aggregate all of their information. Um, yeah, it could get scaled up in really interesting ways. All right. Um, and then uh, I have a question about lakes now that might have more than one public accesses. And maybe this is a two part question. One maybe um, like how the model handles that issue and the other being, could the model help tell you which access on a lake like that might be um, the best place to place those inspectors? All right, so there's, yeah, so two parts to that. Um, so I'll, I'll take the risk one first. The, um, I mentioned very briefly that when we were filling in the gaps of the uh, network, we use lake characteristics and characteristics of the surrounding area to sort of infer um, information. And uh, one of those pieces of information were how many access, if the lake has an access, of course, and then how many access points and how many um, parking spaces are at that access. Just trying to get a sense of how popular it might be. Um, so that becomes important for the risk model. Um, if there's more accessibility, it becomes a riskier lake. Um, for the watercraft inspection optimization, um, the number of access points are not included because we don't, at least not at the state level. Um, we've been playing around with some county versions of this and we could do that if the county has the information, but the way the data comes in through the survey, we don't know with confidence which access point the survey is conducted at. I don't know how popular the east boat ramp is compared to the west boat ramp. Um, that's local information that if counties were collecting it, we could start to build it in. Um, we've been brainstorming how to go about doing that, but for a statewide data set, um, it's not possible right now. So it just aggregates the lake as one and it's up to the local person to decide which boat ramp they put them at or if it's both. All right, great. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, so do, does, does the model have any way to account for um, or predict based on private ramps as well? Is there any way to account for those? Um, if it's, uh, so we have a, a big spreadsheet of all the lakes and lakes with boat ramps. Um, those are almost exclusively public access points. Um, so private access can show up on occasion uh, if they are participating in the inspection surveys. So I think we'll get that sometimes. Um, what we did though, uh, we did not, so if a lake um, didn't have a public access, 
it still shows up in the risk model um, and sometimes in the, depending on the type of water body, sometimes in the optimization model too. Um, that's assuming that boats are still getting into lakes. Like we know they're connected to the network. People say they're at a lake that doesn't have a public ramp. So we're trying to, um, it's not directly accounting for a private access point, but it is a connection. Like it is access in some way. Um, so it's not a quantifiable thing, but it's accounted for, if, if that makes any sense. It's sort of this gray area in the model. <laughs> All right, perfect. Thank you, and that, that timing was great. It brought us right to two o'clock. So um, with that, I will, I'll wrap up. There are a few questions left in here that we weren't able to get to. Um, so if you had a question that we did not answer, don't worry. Um, Nick graciously offered to answer questions that we didn't get to in a type format. So we will have those, um, we'll try to get those out alongside the recordings. When the recording goes live, we'll try and also have um, Nick's answers typed up alongside those. You will get a message um, in Eventbrite the same way that you registered, um, letting you know that that recording is ready. Um, you can also see the link to our YouTube channel there. You can subscribe and YouTube will send you a notification too when we, when we post new things. Um, Nick's email, as I promised, is available on the screen right now. It's phelp083 at umn.edu. Feel free to connect with him as well if you want to ask more questions or give him feedback on any of the things that he suggested. Um, our program email is available as well. That's aisdetectors at umn.edu. So if you have um, questions or comments for us on the webinar series as a whole um, or other programs that we host, feel free to reach out um, to us there. Um, with that, I will wrap things up and say thank you to Nick for joining us and sharing um, your wonderful presentation with us. And thanks to all of you for signing in and listening. Have a great rest of your day.